you know, there's a lot of benefits of ketones for the brain. Um, but who, who should be thinking about a ketogenic diet? Who would this be for? And then who would it not be for? Yeah. So for a ketogenic diet, you know, number one, you know, and really the, probably the, the number one population group that uh, applies a ketogenic diet is going to be people that are looking to lose weight. And that makes sense because ketogenic diet is really using your own body weight or your own body fat, I should say, as an energy source. So you become a fat burner. Most people out there are sugar burners, meaning that their body is really dependent. Their energy levels are really dependent on where their blood sugar is and their, and their blood sugar is going up and down and they have poor glycemic control and they're not good at breaking into their own body fat and using it as an energy source. So ketogenic diet gets us very metabolically flexible where we're good at burning both our own sugar, right? It's stored sugar in our muscles and liver as well as our own body fat. So people that are overweight for sure, you know, it's a great person, you know, it's a great candidate for somebody to, uh, to, to, to be on a ketogenic diet. Also people that are concerned about neurodegenerative uh, disease, maybe they have it in their family. Um, perhaps they're having early warning signs like forgetfulness, brain fog, um, mood issues, things like that. That can be somebody as well. Um, also, you know, people that have maybe a history of cancer or perhaps they're dealing with cancer as well. A lot of good research on ketogenic diets being an effective strategy for helping slow cancer growth. You know, it's not a cure for cancer, but it's a strategy to help slow the growth. And uh, when combined with either, you know, natural or um, conventional cancer therapies can actually be very, very effective. Um, it's an effective kind of baseline foundational plan for somebody that's trying to heal from cancer. So those would be really, really good candidates. You know, people that I wouldn't recommend a ketogenic diet for are pregnant women. Okay. Now we can still be on a lower carbohydrate, blood sugar stabilizing plan, but you know, when you're pregnant, you certainly shouldn't make it a goal to be in ketosis. That's not, a should, it's not an accurate goal. Also children, um, high level athletes that are, you know, um, exercising for hours a day, not necessarily, uh, you know, the best benefits there with ketogenic diet. Now getting into ketosis, slipping into ketosis from time to time, maybe intermittent fasting or like a few days of low carb at a time, uh, can be beneficial for most people, but following, you know, a ketogenic diet for months at a time, not necessarily beneficial for, you know, a lot of folks out there other than those that I, I mentioned the benefits for. Awesome. Yeah. I think this is one of the interesting things, especially when we talk about the biggest category you mentioned of um, people who maybe have metabolic syndrome or maybe are trying to lose weight where ketosis can be a really powerful tool. Um, but there's also a lot of, at least I I find a lot of diversity in how people respond in terms of some people feel amazing. Um, they lose weight, you know, they reverse their diabetes or whatever chronic condition. Um, other people have these you know, their, their lipids skyrocket. They maybe don't feel like they have a lot of energy and don't tend to respond as well. And that's where I think we try to use genetics as a guide, but they're, they're not always, you don't, you know, you don't always know what you're going to get. So even for example, myself, several years ago, I did a very tightly controlled 12 week ketogenic diet experiment. And based on my genetics, I probably would not have expected my lipids to respond very well, given how much saturated fat I was consuming but everything really seemed to improve. So a lot of times you also, you know, there's so much we still have to learn and we don't know until we do that experiment in ourselves. But I was just curious what you see or, or if you see people not responding well, um, how do you adjust or how do you um, think they should proceed? Yeah, you know, there's certainly a genetic component that some people are going to have an easier time than others. Also, there's a lot of people out there that have sluggish bile flow and poor stomach acid production. And these are people that when they eat a steak, they have acid reflux. They, um, you know, just feel they have brain fog, low energy, right? They just, they just do not perform well. Like they don't feel good. Okay. And that's actually one of the tests I'll do is I'll have them do what we call the steak test where you eat a six ounce steak. Sounds like a fun test. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some salt on it, but you know, no, nothing else, no vegetables or anything because we want to isolate it. We want to see how good is your body at producing stomach acid here to be able to break this down and digest it. And, you know, if you feel, you, normally you should feel really good. It's a very blood sugar stabilizing meal, a lot of protein, healthy fats in there. Again, if you feel sluggish, you have heartburn, you have gas, bloating, this is a sign you're not producing most likely stomach acid. There may be a bile component as well. 
Um, and that may do, be due to an infection like an H. pylori infection, could be due to overuse of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You know, there's a number of different conditions that can be associated with this. And so then we want to try to support your stomach acid levels. We might try taking apple cider vinegar beforehand, which stimulates all your digestive juice production, your vagus nerve, to help you be able to break that down. Um, you know, there's different things that we can do. And I go through that, you know, a lot of my, on my website and my videos. Um, but that's kind of one of the first things. We want to see how well does your body respond when we're consuming you know, a quote unquote ketogenic food or a ketogenic meal and see if, you know, it has to do with what's happening in your gut, right? And so that's one of the key things. When it comes to lipids, not overly concerned. You know, the biggest thing I look at with lipids is your HDL, your triglyceride to HDL ratio, which always should be under two. I like to see triglycerides always under a hundred. And ideally that triglyceride to HDL ratio is close to one as possible, meaning one part triglyceride, one part HDL. Not overly concerned about where your LDL is. There's actually a response called the lean mass hyper responder where, and I'm actually one of these people where some people that are very low in body fat, they're lean. Okay. When they follow a lower carb diet, their LDL will go up and sometimes quite a bit. However, their triglycerides will be, you know, their triglyceride HDL ratio will be close to one. Their insulin, fasting insulin will be at its optimal range, which I like to see somewhere between two and six. Um, you know, and it's so like, I'll test my, you know, I do my blood work twice a year. My insulin is usually around three, right. And HDL is usually around 70 or so triglycerides 60, but my LDL might be, you know, 280, right. Or something like that. And this is this lean mass hyper responder approach. Now the, the particles are small, I'm sorry, they're, they're large buoyant LDL particles. We want to make sure they're not the small dense LDL particles, which are much, much more atherogenic. And we know that they're not if your triglycerides are low and your, you know, your triglyceride to HDL ratio is um, close to one, right? And so and your insulin is low. And so then I've got these a larger amount of LDL particles, but they have lots of fat soluble nutrients on them, protecting them from oxidative stress. So this lean mass hyper responder, um, this, this, this physiological response is not pathogenic. You know, I think that we've just been so conditioned to believe that, okay, high LDL is bad. Okay. But not for everybody. It's bad if you have high insulin, right? If you have high insulin, you have more reactive oxygen species, you have more inflammation in your body. And then those LDL particles can, can very much be oxidized. But if you're in, if you're very insulin sensitive, you have lower amounts of reactive oxygen species, and those LDL particles are not necessarily bad. You know, they're obviously bringing a lot of phospholipids and fat soluble nutrients to the cells, meaning that they're going to be protected uh, because they've got these things on their bus. You know, they're basically a bus carrying all this cargo to the cell. Um, and on top of that, you know, they're bringing valuable cellular components out to the cell. So this can be a response. I also think that there's a level of, you know, this lean mass hyper responder approach also tends to happen with people that exercise a lot, right? More active. And that makes mm -hmm. sense as well because, you know, people that are very active uh, also need more cellular turnover, right? They, they have, they have um, they're breaking down muscle cells, different things like that. So they may need more of this, you know, more phospholipids and things like that being brought out by the LDL to the cell membrane for repair processes.